Hello everybody. Welcome back. Uh, how are you today? I will wait for another minute or two for other people to join and then we will then we will continue. Okay, uh, welcome again. So before we continue today's lecture, I will quickly summarize what we did yesterday. So yesterday we looked in slightly more detail on the example of adaptive control, where uh, recursive least squares was used uh, to constantly identified the, uh, the system model and based on the system model the controller was updated. Uh, after that we looked at the nonlinear system identification. We looked at the uh, recommendation, recommendations based on Takan's theorem, how to select the order of the nonlinear model. We looked at the bias variance trade-off as a kind of a measure of the quality of the model. Uh, we looked quickly on some uh, practical recommendations, how to attack the nonlinear system identification problem. And we looked at the simple example of uh, using a multi-layer perception for a, a modeling of a dynamic system. Do you have uh, do you have any questions regarding uh, yesterday's lecture? How is my sound quality today? Perfect. Okay. All right. So we will continue today. Uh, now today. Uh, we're going to take a look at the multiple model networks and uh, from that we're going to actually not derive but uh, we're going to get to the local model networks and then probably tomorrow uh, we're going to take a look at the examples of uh, how to use local model net networks for control for nonlinear control. Uh, Today's lecture is going to be probably the most, the most philosophical of all of them, right? So we are going to take a look the more or less basic principles, and then tomorrow we're going to take a look on uh, some applications of the local model network, um, local models for control. So uh, now. Uh, it is quite, ah, maybe it isn't. We will start with, the, with the yesterday's example. So uh, we're going to take a look at the, uh, of a modeling and the control of a nonlinear system again. 
So we're going to take a look at the CSTR, uh, the tank reactor as yesterday. Uh, and yesterday I spent a bit of time, quite a bit of time explaining how, uh, how the CSTR can be controlled to use the, use the uh, adaptive control. What we have seen was that for a small set point changes, so assuming that that adaptation is turned on all the time, for that for the small set point changes, the adaptive control works relatively well, where for the bigger set point changes, right, it takes a, quite a bit of time uh, for the controller to bring the system to a steady state due to constant uh, constant to the adaptation. So slowness of adaptation might result in the large transient errors. This is what we've seen yesterday. And here is an example of a very big set point change where we see that the system actually becomes uh, unstable in this case. So uh, now what we, what we can do here, right? So one of the so there are many approaches to cope with that. For example, the train, um, train the retrain the controller again, well, uh, the model again, and uh, enhance the controller when this is needed. Uh, so there are many strategies. One of them would be one of the strategy one one one, the, one particular st the strategy. Ah, so yeah, have you here eigentlich yeah? What? Okay. Uh, where, 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 where did I stop? Okay. Now, uh, now, one of the strategies would be, for example, that we uh, identify one of the models, for example, for the lo one low operating region one in the middle, right? And one uh, for the high uh, operating region. And that we remember those models and the controllers. So we put them in some sort of a database. And when the system comes to that particular operating point, we switch in appropriate, appropriate model and a appropriate controller. Uh, and this, the, the strategy like that, is shown here. Uh, so, for example, what we have here, we have a plant, a plant. So now, tell me, what did, do you see my toolbar as well? Is it is is? We see, uh, yeah, go on. We see the, the presentation and the red dot. On the pointer. You see what? Where, where is the red dot now? On the on the lower part of the screen lower point of the screen so you see and that uh, you see the entire screen right so nothing is yeah. nothing is disturbing the lower part of the screen yeah the, the, we just can't see the at um, at least uh, the side numbers the, the page numbers yeah okay do you see this this bottom line the feedback yeah yep. okay that's fine that's all right okay so now the point is here what we have we have our system our plant and we have, let's say, pre-identified models, right? So, so these models were, they have been identified in advance, in advance. So each model, it has its corresponding controller. And then what we do, we look at the error between the models that we have, it, that we have identified it before and the actual state of the plant and this we then we have some sort of a supervisor which decides it looks on the on the error which one is a minimum so which one is the smallest error and then based on the smallest error it switches in the appropriate controller right so this the supervisor is usually kind of operating based on some sort of equation like that right where we have some parameters uh, in order to make uh, to make supervisor realize which model is the best at a particular time. Uh, 
and basically uh, no so so here's the explanation so we look at the error right the cost is calculated for the each model right so the cost is based on the error right and then the one uh, the model right and and the corresponding controller with the smallest or with the best cost is then switched in do you understand that do you do you understand the uh, the principle behind it okay so now here i have now the results i can actually i will run the i will run the simulation uh okay so basically i run it again so we're not going to run the we're not going to run the adaptive i just see does it work it does so uh Okay, so now this is my simulink block diagram of the switching, switching system, right? So, so we have the, our CSTR plant. We have the three models and the three corresponding controllers. These models, they have been identified using exactly the same tuning algorithm as we used yesterday so basically what we did so what i did before that i brought the system at the low operating point i turned on the adaptation so identification and the controller tuning and when the model was identified right i pressed the button and I stored the model and the corresponding controller in this block for example this is for low operating point this one and this two, right, for the middle operating point is this model, and this two parts of the controller, and for the high, this two. So, uh, if I run that now, right, what we see, we see that, that we have across the entire, for the, let's say, for the high operating, uh, for the big set point changes, we get a bit of an overshoot, but it is much, much, much better. Right, the response is much better than the one with the constant adaptation, right? Uh, and for the gradual set point changes, also we get we get a slight difference between the uh, between the regions, especially here in between two models, uh, in between two regions, where the supervisor doesn't really know which one to to select, right? But still, if we take a look at the response it is better than a constantly updating the controller and the model parameters. So now tell me, so this is now our response, the blue one. So the blue one is a set point change and the yellow one was, is, is a closed loop response where we see that our system, right, the closed loop follows our reference quite well. On the bottom, right, on the bottom graph, uh, the switch position. So this switch position is shown. So basically it shows us which model and hence which controller is selected at the particular time instance. So what can you, what can you say about this bottom graph about the switch position? Anyone? What can be observed here? It switches very often at the beginning. It switches very often at the beginning here, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, it does. Right? Now, so what? Is this a problem or is it not a problem? I would say it's not ideal. It's not ideal. That's true. It is, it is in this particular example, Right, it is not a problem, but this repeating switches, switching, right? What we see here, up and down and up and down and up and down, right? If this happens constantly, 
right? This is a very dangerous for the system to get uh, into the limit cycle, right? Or it, it can uh, become unstable. So uh, switching is fine as long as you can, uh, as long as you can assure a stability. And in this case, for the for that kind of a very heavy uh, nonlinear systems, this is very hard to achieve. So uh, again, we get we get a better response than with the adaptive control. Yet you need to take care that uh, that the system does not become unstable. All right. So that's the that's the moral of the story. So if I if we take a look on uh, let's say the results that I have recorded before, right? The repeating switching can be seen here, right? In uh, uh, with the small set point changes uh, between when the supervisor can't really decide which model is the best at the particular time. Okay. Now, uh, so. Here, what I want to make it, I want to make a kind of a link. I, I want to kind of a make a, okay. I want to kind of a make a story about how do we, what is a, what could be an approach, how to model a nonlinear systems. So with tank reactor, as we have seen, the system behaves completely different at the uh, different operating points. So the dynamic of the system is much very different here, right? At the, at the concentrations, kind of a, at the low concentrations than at the high concentrations, right? Very, very different. Uh, but if we, if we kind of limit ourselves for a small, for a one operating region, we can identify a linear model at that particular point, right? So that linear model represents the system well at this particular operating point, but it is wrong uh, elsewhere. So the idea is that what we can do, we can, we, can, we can divide the operating region into the different sub operating regions. And then we model or we, we try to find the model for a small operating region. And then what we end up, we end up with the many different models. And this, this philosophy, this approach is called uh, a divide and conquer approach. And the, the resulting model would, uh, would be called a multiple model network. Right? And what we actually are doing here, we divide the operating space right, shown here as a donated with the U and K, uh, UK and YK. We divide the, oper the operating space at a different sub operating space around a particular operating point. And then we identify the linear model, right, or, or some sort of a model. It does not necessarily to be linear, but the, some sort of the model, right, which is valid at and around that particular point. So our nonlinear system can be seen as a nonlinear, uh, let's say surface above the operating point. And our mini models can be seen as a local kind of a uh, local approximations. Uh, just one second boys. Uh, is this clear? Is this, is this representation uh, clear what I want to say? Have you seen that before? The idea is clear. I didn't see it before. Yeah, okay. But I mean, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not very, uh, I mean, it's, it's easy. 
in reality, right? So, and, and now the mathematical representation. So if I just have shown you a formula, the equation, it would be, it would be probably harder to understand. So what we have, we have a model, right? Of a nonlinear system where we want to make a prediction, which is YK plus one, which is here, right? So the delay of yk plus one is that is then actually our output, right? In the continuous time domain, that would be a derivative and this would be an integrator. Okay, so now the our, let's say the prediction yk plus one. So this is something that, that comes before the, before the actual uh, output. So that's why it's called prediction. Uh, is a function of, is a nonlinear function of the output, which we have it here. Right, plus a nonlinear function of the input, which we have it here, and that would create some sort of a nonlinear surface above above the operating space. So the linear surface would be just kind of a, a plane, right? But since the system is nonlinear, we have a kind of a nonlinear surface. And then the, the divide and conquer approach would be right to really. Uh, kind of a have some sort of a division around the operating point, right? And this, you see this gray kind of a block here in this, uh, in this representation, this is a validity function, right? Or membership function, which tells us which model is actually valid at that particular operating point. Okay? Right, so, uh, okay, let's go further. So uh, now the mathematical representation, right, of all of them, of all of this, uh, let's say, local models covering, let's say, a portion of the operating space would be uh, yk plus one. This is our our prediction, right, which is a sum of the mo of the models, right, mi, right, multiplied by its uh, validation function validity function it's also called or membership function. So for example, for the local model, for the model here, right? The, the membership function, this one would be zero, right? And it, would, it is only valid above the operating point, right? So again, this is a prediction, right? Our prediction. This is the number of the local models, right? This is the, let's say a particular local model, and that's the validity function of its particular local model. Okay, I, I believe this, this is clear, right? It's not that hard to understand. Now, what we have here, we have a different choices of what kind of a local models these can be, right? And we have also a choice what kind of a validity function we can choose. So one of the one of the possible local models could be so the simplest one could be just a number, just a weight, right? And one possible selection of a validity function can be, for example, the radial basis function, the one as we have seen many lectures before. Right, and in this case, a representation of the local model of local model network would be basically the radial basis function uh, a neural network right so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, the local model network can be seen also as a radial basis function uh, neural network. And let's take a look, a quick example, right? So imagine that we have, uh, that we have our system, right, like that. Yk plus one is 0 0.2 tange yk plus sine uk. So this is very, very, very nonlinear. System is far away from being linear. And what we do is, uh, uh, and if we actually plot now our real system, right? That would be our our true function. So what we do now, we uh, collect some data, 
we excite the system across the entire operating region, right? And we collect the data and the data points uh, are, are represented here in the operating space. So this is UK, uh, uh, YK and UK, right? Is our operating, operating space. So what we do, so what we do now, we use the uh, real deal basis function neural, ne neural network, right? And we place a centers randomly around the, uh, randomly in some data points, either in some data points and just we place them randomly. And uh, then what we, we do, we select the sigmas, so the widths of the, of the uh, validity functions, we, we select them, we don't, we don't optimize them. And then we calculate the weights, so the Ws, using the least squares and the pseudo inverse. And uh, this is what we get for a different selections of, uh, different selections of the centers and the sigmas, right? So uh, this example here shows us that the sigmas are too small, right? So basically our, our approximation, our model approximation is too spiky. So it does not, it does not model the, the system well, right? So remember that what we are expecting, we're expecting something, something like this, right? Uh, if we choose uh, a little bit more number of centers and the sigmas a little bit wider, we get approximation like this, right? Like, like shown in a, in, a, in a B picture, right? Another approximation, which is the best of all of them is C, right? And the D shows us where the sigmas are way too big. Okay. I guess this is again, clear. So, and now this is our cost on the validation data, right? And what and uh, uh, we are observing the cost based on the number of centers and the how many sigmas uh, how big the sigma uh, the sigmas of the validity functions are right and we see that we get the best kind of a choice of the centers around I think it says 95 right and the sigma should be around 3.27 uh, 3 right 3.3 something like that. In this case, we get approximation using the real deal basis uh, function neural network as shown in the graph C. Is this clear? Come on. Do you understand what I am talking about? There's no no, there's no yes. What should I think about that? Okay. Now, uh, let's take a look, let's take a look again. The, uh, using the, basically what happens is a, uh, using the radial basis function neural network. Again, we need to take care of a bias variance trade-off so that we select a correct amount of a, of a neurons. So that means centers, right? Why, when we try to find out the weights, right? We end up with the numerical difficulties. We, we did that before, right? When we, when we need to use the pseudo inverse in order to find the weights, right? Uh, and that actually comes together with the regularization. So we need to make sure that, that, uh, that the weights, they do not become too big and too small. We did that before. And now, so this is, this, this three bullet points, this is something that you know from before. But what you probably don't know is uh, the transparency and the curse of dimensionality. The lack of transparency means, now, if we have that, uh, that neural network here, which we are happy with, right? And then what we do, we go observing the weights, right? And we see uh, what the weights are. The, the actual parameters, so 
So that means the weights. They do not tell us anything about the system we want to model. So that means by looking at the parameters of the model which we found, right, we cannot make any conclusions about the system we have modeled. Right? And this means this this is this means that the model is not transparent at all. The curse of dimensionality means that uh, the more complex is the model, much, much more parameters we need to, we need to find, we need to calculate. And uh, the number of parameters that we need to find, to calculate or optimize or train, whatever you want to call it, right? It uh, increases dramatically with the dimension of the input space. So that means with the number of inputs and the number of outputs. So this is very simple model. It's a very, very simple example that we looked at, right? So, hello? Yeah. So we looked at this. Uh, this is very, very simple example. It's a first order. So that means one input and one output, right? And only one, um, actually our structure of the model is selected to be the first order. We, we only have one delay, right? And in just to model that kind of a very simple nonlinear system, we needed to find out the 95, 95 weights. So 95 for parameters for very, very simple model. Now imagine that the, uh, the system we want to model is much more complex. So it has many more inputs and many more outputs. So in this case, the number of weights, the number of parameters that we need to find would be a lot, would be, would, we would be talking millions here, right? And this is called the curse of dimensionality. So increasing the number, the, the number of inputs and outputs increases dramatically the number of parameters we need to find. So, if we now follow the philosophy that I want to present here. So, at the, what we looked at, it was a representation of a, just a kind of a general representation of the local model network or the multiple model network. Then, we, if we select it, if we, if we decide that, that the basis functions Right, the validity functions are going to be a radial basis functions. And if we decided that the, that the models, they're going to be just a simple weights, then we end up with the radial basis function neural network. As the one that we were talking about that before many times, right? Now, if we select that the radial basis function, right, is uh, that, that uh, Virility function is still some sort of the radial basis function, but instead of a simple weight, right, instead of the number, we decide that this is going to be a linear approximation of the, of the surface, then we end up with so-called local model network, which actually means that we have a virility function as a Gaussian bell, like that, right? And on the top of it, right, instead of just a simple weight moving in it up and down, we actually have a local linear approximation of a particular surface at that particular operating point, right? So again, so the basis function, so that the that, uh, uh, utility function is this part of the equation, right? And the local model would be a leader approximation. And then of course we need to many of them, right? In order to model the surface and then we sum of them all, all of them together. Now, this is now called a local model network, which means that we have a number of local models which are valid around the, the uh, operating point. Is this clear? Anyone? Okay. 
All right. Now, once we decide that we're going to have a local model network, right? We need to train the local model network. So we need to we need to get it. Right? And as 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 all as always, right? There is we need to find the structure or the topology of the network, right? So we need to find the the optimum number of local models. So that means how many of them are we going to place out around so one, two, five, seven, twenty million. So this is something that we need to find out. We need to find where they're going to be placed, right? Then we need to find the shape of the virility functions. Right? Either they're going to be a Gaussian bells or they're going to be something different, right? And we need to find the appropriate scheduling vector. About the scheduling vector and the scheduling variable, we are going to, I'm going to talk in about probably 20 minutes or half an hour. Uh, now, the structure, uh, the structure of the network depends of, of course, of the complexity of the system. So if the system is slightly nonlinear, right? So if this surface, right, is kind of a, is not really kind of a curvy and uh, it's kind of a half, let's say, more or less linear trend, then not, then less local models are needed, right? If it's more complex, more local models uh, are needed. And when we, when we are selecting or we are identifying or optimizing the structure, whatever you want to call it, right? We have two, we really have a two choices, right? One is a, a, a forward regression, right? Uh, this is usually uh, taken, this, this is usually the case that uh, structure is optimized, right? So we assume a simple structure first, and then network grows according to the complexity. So we try a simple one, two, three local models, and then when we see the, that our uh, network is not accurate enough, then we add local models wherever it's needed. So, uh, and then we have a backward regression. When we have, when we assume the complex structure at the beginning and then we merge neighboring local models if the parameters if their parameters are similar enough right and uh, usually we actually measure the distance the Euclidean distance uh, of the parameters or between the local models vectors in order to kind of uh, decide to merge them or not right so uh, and then what we what we also need to do we need to select the validity functions right now up until here is this is this clear what is your level of confusion how much do you do you understand what i have said and uh, how hard it is for you to understand Come on. No, seriously, I need a feedback now because I really don't know. I don't know to do understand what I said or not. Um, for what exactly is the validity function used? Um, what criteria do we use to select the function? Experience. Uh, validity function is the function which tells us uh, where the model is valid, right? And right now I am going to explain uh, a few tricks or a few difficulties regarding the validity, validity functions, right? The common choice, I mean, really the common choice of validity functions are the, these Gaussian belts, right? And there is, a, there is a reason for that. They are, uh, I mean, with this, with the, with the Gaussian bell, right, you have basically you have two parameters, which is a center and the width. And with those two parameters, you can really shape the reality function quite well, right? This is one thing. And the second thing is they are smooth, 
which means when you use the optimization uh, where, where you use uh, derivatives, right? So the, steep, the steepest descent uh, optimization, then this is, um, you can actually find the derivative because those functions are smooth. If you have used something else, then you would end up, you would end up uh, in difficulties. Uh, if those, if ability functions are not kind of a smooth across the entire region, then you can't find the uh, derivative. So the, the, so in real, I mean, you can choose any virility function you want, but um, radial basis function, so the, the Gaussian bell is really commonly used function. And once we have, once we have the local model approach, that means that we have a number, a number of local models, uh, which means uh, which represents the kind of a local linearization of the system. It is important that the virility functions are one across the entire operating space. So that means the partition of unity needs to be achieved. I guess, I guess you understand that. I, I think you have found that you know that from before, from somewhere else, right? So when you do some spline, so, so kind of a, kind of a, uh, linearizations and you, you combine those things together, right? You need to make sure that the partition of unity is achieved and the partition of unity. So is achieved by a normalization of the virility functions. And the normalization is done like that so that, that we, first of all, that we find the sum of the all virility functions together, right? And then we divide each of them with the, with the sum. And, this, and that will actually give us uh, the functions which are then different but the sum of all of them will give us a partition of unity. Uh, is this clear? Right. Now, the normalization, so this equation shown here, the normalization introduces interaction between the functions which have really unwanted, un unwanted side effects. And uh, uh, so these side effects, so the, the function is not, Gaussian bell is not a Gaussian bell anymore, but it's some, some distorted function, right? So the maxima is, is, is shifted. So the tip of the Gaussian bell is not where we have placed it before. So it's shifted. Right. Uh, then the entire operating space is then covered with the validity, right? Even even where we don't have a local model, right? Uh, and it's not necessary, right, that these functions decrease monotonically where the uh, where the models are not valid anymore. Right, so these are the four bullet points which I just told you, right? And without an example, this is impossible to understand, right? Do, does any of you know what I have just said? What does that mean that the maxima can be shifted from their centers? Come on, anyone? Okay, let's take a look at an example. Uh, so now I have the, ah, uh, let's go, all right. So these are my three, these are my three uh, Gaussian bells in one single dimension, right? And the sum of these three Gaussian bell, bells is the purple line, right? So this is, this is the sum of them. And then what you see that 
not in uh, on the entire operating space. Uh, so somewhere we have one, somewhere we don't have one, Mo most of the time we don't. And what we actually want, we want that entire, entire all in, across the all operating space, right? The sum of the of relative function functions is one, right? On this side, we have a normalized uh, functions, right? And the purple, the purple line is the actually sum of these normalized functions. And now you see the, for example, this blue Gaussian bell is normalized here, right? The red one is normalized in this, uh, in this side, and the, the yellow one is again the normalized on this side. So what we see, the sum of them, it is one, right? But now they are very, very different than the non-normalized. Non Okay, but then again, if you want to actually, if you want to use the validity functions for the local model networks, they need to be normalized. And then this is what we can end up with. We're going to run that again. So basically what we see, what we see on this animation is what happens when, so the sigmas are all the same. No, they're not. The, the sigmas, they change, right? And the centers of the functions they change and by doing that we see what kind of a, what do we get when we do the normalization right so you see that they really 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 change a lot okay is this example is this clear and this is something we don't want so and this is a this is this is as it is, but this is a problem really. So I'm going to break it and I'll show some more examples. Uh, now, this is one case, right? One, one, one position, whatever that is. So when we have a four centers and a four validity functions placed like that. So the four centers and the four sigmas. So what happened is, so here, so the red one is placed at 0 0.3 or something like that. So this is its center. We see that the center here is still around that place, right? It's slightly off. But what we see that the red one gets reactivated at the site of the operating space. So that means that the red one is not only active where it should be, but it is also active where it definitely should not be. Right? This is called reactivation. And if you take a look, the yellow one, this one here, it has a center at, the, at exactly at two, right? And where the normalized one, you see, does not have, well, center is still here, but it does not have a maxima at two anymore and it got shifted. And this is what I was, was, what I was telling you before, so that the, the, might, the maximas might get shifted, right? And also for the purple one, the maxima got shifted. Also, the yellow one gets reactivated at the site of the operating space. Do you understand that? Okay, now, uh, the example, if you take a look, what happens if we have the centers that they are equidistantly placed across the operating space, right? It is slightly better, but not really at least they, the, the maximas, they don't get shifted too much, right? But then again, as you see in the purple, it still get reactivated somewhere else, which is, which is completely wrong. So that means we, we want to have a model that it is valid here, but then after the, after the norm normalization, the, let's say the purple model, which should be valid here, is valid here and here. So oh, this is 
this is again something that it is a problem. If we have now, let's say, the equidistant centers and the constant sigmas for all of them, right? We get a slightly better, slightly better result, right? The the maximas are not really shifted that much anymore, uh, but yet, I mean, the model is extrapolated at the side of the operating space where it probably shouldn't get. Okay, now let's take a look of uh, a normalization. So in the three-dimensional example, right, where the normalization is not too bad. So for example, that we have placed our local models and our, we set our validity functions uh, like this, all right, so if you take a look at that, for example, one local model here, 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 here. And then after the normalization, we get our validity functions like that. So that means this local model is still valid where it should be. This local model is valid where it should be, but it's valid also around uh, at the side of the operating space. This one is then valid around here this one here and so on. So we have, we have a strong side effects, but again, they're not, they're not so, so, so wrong, right? If we take a look what happens when the sigmas are small, right? We get kind of a more crisp transition between the operating region, right? So the local models are valid more, let's say they, they do not interpolate between them in a kind of a, a smooth manner, right? And here is an example when we get the reactivation like that. So, and this is something which, which, which actually has a difficulty. So you see that, for example, a local model here, right? Gets reactivated at the back of the one local model, which is here. So this local model corresponds to that. So it, it is valid here, but everywhere around, for example, this local model is valid, which might be a problem. Okay, is this clear up to now? The side effects of normalization will create difficulties. Okay, all right, so. Let's continue with that now. So we did this example. Uh, so now I was talking about the about the uh, validity function, and now let's talk about the parameterization of the local model network. So before I was talking about this, right? And now let's talk about the little surface sitting on the top of the validity function. So these is the local models are uh, the local models are the linear approximations. So that means that they are linear, right? Which means that we can find them uh, by using the tools which we learned how to use them in the previous lectures in the linear system denial, okay? Uh, so now, two ways of finding the local model parameters exist. One is a global learning, which means that all the parameters of the local models are found at the same time, right? Uh, and then, I mean, of course, it's assumed that they are linear in parameters, right? And they are all the parameters at the same time, they are estimated in a single regression run, right? Which is kind of a nice because it doesn't take long, but then, then parameters using this kind of a learning, they're not really independent of each other, right? So it's kind of a, they're kind of a grown together, right? They're not really, separatable, right? And 
if they are not really separatable, that means that they're not really an accurate linearization. They're still better than, than nothing, but they're not really the accurate linearization of the, of the surface uh, at the operating point. Which means, I'll come back to that later. And then when we have a local learning, so that means what we do, we actually try to find the local model at that particular operating space. And uh, basically what happens is we just use a system identification techniques, right? At the operating region and then identify the local linearized model. So that means we need to inject the, the excitation signal, we need to record the data, we need to filter the data, and then we get a local, uh, local linearization, local, local model. This is exactly what we, had, what we have done at the beginning of this lecture, right? So we identified the three local models for our CSTR and then used them for control, right? For the switching in between them. Uh, and of course, this kind of a uh, parameterization of local models, they bring all the difficulties that we have, that we have faced, that I tried to explain it to you with the uh, linear system identification. But the important difference here is uh, the, once we have the parameters of a local model, Right? And when we look at the parameters of the local model, these parameters then can tell us something about the underlying system. Which means by introducing the local models for a modeling of a nonlinear system, we increase a transparency. So if you just take one of the local models, we and we observe that particular local model, then we know something about the system at that particular operating point. We know what is, a, for example, a gain of the system of that particular operating point. We know what is the damping, what is the natural frequency. If the, mo if the uh, model is of a first order, then we know a tau, the time constant of the system, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? Which where? At when we use the global learning, we would not be able to see that. And when we use the, for example, the neural network, we have absolutely no idea by looking at the weights, what is going on of the, about the system at that particular operating point. Is this clear? Come on. Okay, we will do now, uh, we will do a quick example of the local model network, right? But uh, we will make a short two or three minutes break here, right? I'll be back in, uh, in a second, right?
I am back. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so we can we can continue. All right. Uh, so we will do now the same example, right? So we will do this example as it was done before with the neural networks. So this example, we will do it again with the local model networks. Like that, right? So what we do, we identify the five local models, right? At the different operating space, at the operating points, like that, right? And this is done really, I mean, we have the system and we inject the, the PRBS signal into the input with a small amplitude and we collect the data, right? And the data are, is also plotted here around the big black dots. So those small gray dots are the data collected around the operating, uh, around the operating point, right? And then we really use the linear system identification techniques. So that means least squares, right? And we get the local, the local model parameters, right? And the local model parameters. So then when we find these local models, right? Those lo linear local approximations, they look like a small little, little surfaces right so at that particular operating point uh, on basically they're touching the the nonlinear surface right uh, so now what we do so what we so now since when once we have these local models so again that was this is quite a bit of work right collect data for each of the local model, filter it, blah, 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 right? Get the parameters, validate it, right? And these are, for example, five local models here, right? So once we have them, then we need to, we need to place the Gaussian or some sort of a validity functions in order to make these local models valid across the, uh, around the operating point, right? And then we need to sum of them, all of them together in order to get the model that it is valid across the operating space. Now, uh, what we can do, we can, we can choose a Gaussian shaped function, right? So if you choose a Gaussian shaped function, but what, what it can happen, what, what we can do, we can use, we can choose a function like that, right? So that it is, has the Gaussian shape in one dimension, right? And it is constant in the other dimension, right? And this, right? This is called the choice of the scheduling vector or the scheduling variable. So now the scheduling variable in our case right, scheduling variable is donated with the phi, would be if you choose it, uh, if you choose the u, so the input, so this particular dimension, in this dimension we do schedule, right, we take our Gaussian bell like that, and it is not, it is a constant in the other dimension. So that means our scheduling var variable is a, uh, our scheduling vector is a scheduling variable of dimension of one and it is UK in this case. If we, if we decide to do so, then the portion of the, for example, the operating space, right? Those, those kind of a blue, blue kind of a ribbons, they represent the validity region of the each validity functions, right, add the sigma, right, like that. So we see the one, one local model is valid here, one is here, one is here, and then it is a little bit of a uh, uh, interpolation between them and here again. And the resulting surface would look as we see it here, okay? 
if we select our the scheduling vector right to be really to be really the, the to be the both inputs uh, so the, the input and the output uk and the yk so in this case we would get the classical gaussian well right and the validity region it is shown here right and in this case we would get our surface our modeled surface which is shown in this particular graph all right so what can you what can you tell me about that so this let's say the scheduling the choosing the dimension of the validity function is a choice of the scheduling vector right and the different choices of the scheduling vector provides a different type of a models right so in this case when we have an extended scheduling vector which means that it has in this case two variables in it right what we get we get the 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 representation that it is really valid across the uh, across the operating region and it comes to zero right uh, at the edges in the previous example we've seen that the model is actually extrapolating into the y dimension right is this good or is this bad it's depends of the depends of the choice right depends of the application also what is important here is that it is desirable right that the scheduling vector has a, the dimension that it is as low as possible because the reduction of the dimension of the scheduling vector reduces the curse of dimensionality and maybe to say something about the curse of dimensionality so comparing this particular surface with the one that we got with the uh, neural network is is similar is a com is comparable i didn't do the real comparison which one is better but it is comparable right but what we have here is we have five models only five of them not nine, 95 as we had before with the neural network if we take a look if you take a closer look at the local models the local models will tell us something about the underlying system right? and the uh, basically dimension is much it's reduced so that means that the curse of, uh, curse of so the dimensionality here is not not such a big problem as it was with the neural network so uh, that's about this particular example is this clear come on questions i mean i i do not believe you that you have been following uh, a local model networks for an hour and 10 minutes and you have no questions come on questions anyone Okay, I'll continue. Uh, well, well I, I maybe I have one question. Eh? Regarding the, the, the fitting of the local linear models, yeah. uh, do you use the, the full, uh, um, so, so, you, so you have the, um, you, you fit it to, to, your, to your underlying data, uh, but which area you use for the, these squares, you also weighted with the Gaussian bell? No, or no, 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 if I did that, if I did that, that would be a global learning. If you, what you do here, right? With the, so so lo, it was local learning approach. It was used. So now this is this is very good question and this is very valid question. So look, what we did, we collected the data. We we designed a specially designed experiment to collect this set of data, right? And then again, this set of data. And then again, this set of data. And this set of data, and this set of data, right? 
And so we have five sets of data and, and using this separate sets of data, right? We used, we then you do the linear system identification, the similar, I mean, not a similar, but exactly the same approach as we did it with the mass spring example, right? You get the parameters of the local models and that's it. Okay, so you define the validity uh, region for the local models beforehand, before Correct. you fit yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do that in this example, yes, right? Because you kind of know, right? You know, I mean, just by looking at it, it would make sense. You would see, you would see that, okay, one local model is here, right? Then the other local model, it would make sense to put it here because it's, here the system behaves very, very, very differently than here, right? This, this curve here is, um, it's so-called the equilibrium curve, right? So when the system gets into the steady state, right? And here we have a, we have a kind of a dynamic around it. And then we see that this local model, right? If you place it here, right, the, the slope of the curve of, curve of equilibria is similar here as in here. So it, it wouldn't really make sense, right, to place another local model here and another local model here. It wouldn't make much, much a benefit. You can do that, it's not a problem, right? But you, but, but you wouldn't gain much. Uh, but you definitely need a local model here because you see the slope here is different than here and you need, you need one here, right? Uh, this is just, let's say, an example, but how to really place these local models, this is, this is a science on its own, right? It is called the partitioning of the operating space. It is, uh, and you have uh, a really the algorithms only for that. And one of them would be a lollymot, maybe you heard of it uh, before or not, so, or, or you can use some artificial intelligence uh, artificial intelligence techniques right for a cluster in the data so it's called a data cluster but in this case we have a definitely right uh, a separate examples uh, separate uh, separate experiments right in order to collect data at predefined operating regions okay Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, uh, the scheduling vector, this is important, right? We will come back to that later as well. But I mean, this is, this is, uh, this is, I mean, it's hard really to explain, but this is the best example I can, cam I can come up with, right? In order to show the difference between the selection of the scheduling vector. Uh, now, so up until now, you might think again, okay, local model, local model networks, cool neural networks, bad, right? But then again, I mean, there, 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 there is a problem with the local model networks as well, right? And this is the off equilibrium dynamic. So this is exactly what I was talking about. So our local model, right? is excited uh, around the operating space, like, like here. So now basically our dynamic is very good covered when the, for example, here, and then for example, here, and then for example, here. Now imagine what happens if we change uh, rapidly, right? If we change the operating region rapidly. So if we move from one operating region to another, but not slowly like that, so that we move around the curve of equilibrium points, but we, we change it rapidly so that we move like that. Right? So what you see that, for example, here, we have absolutely no idea what is going on uh, dynamically, right, in this, in this region. The only, the only information that we have here is from the uh, extrapolation of the model based on the uh, validation on the, on the validity functions, right? And this difficulty, it's called uh, off equilibrium dynamic. So this is what I wanted to show in the, on the previous picture. 
So we have a local model here, for example, we have it here and we have it here, right? And then when we move it around, we might get into the region, right? Into the region when we actually have no information about the model, right? The problem really is the, if you want to have the, the local model here, it's very hard to identify it because it is very hard to excite it in the way that you can collect the data. The data can be only collected somewhere around, around the steady state, right? So this represents a high dynamic and usually the system spends a little time at the off equilibrium points and therefore it is hard to collect the data and sometimes also dangerous. Some, sometimes the data cannot be really, uh, cannot be really collected off, off equilibrium, right? And uh, this, this could be then a problematic from the stability point of view. So that uh, actually our model does not provide enough information off equilibrium. So uh, that means we have the difficulty related to the local model identification in the off equilibrium points. Data, of course, is a problem. It's hard to collect it, right? And uh, uh, if we manage to identify the models of equilibrium, these ones are they're not local linear approximations anymore. They're just something, right? I don't want to go into details about that because already this is complicated enough. Right? And in order to cope with the, non, uh, with the off equilibrium dynamic, it's, uh, there, the, some theory has been developed. Uh, I know those people who develop it, they're, they're, they're my friends. And it's called the velocity linearization. But again, I, I, I don't want to go into, into that at all. Uh, I just want you to know, right, with the local model networks, with the linear local models, right, we might have difficulties in off equilibrium. So off equilibrium dynamic might be a difficulty. Questions? Okay. Now, uh, let's talk about Takagi Tsugeno fuzzy models. Right, so the fuzzy models. What what I want to what what I want to say today is, there are multiple model networks, there are local model networks, there are neural networks. For example, um, uh, radial basis function networks. There are Takagi Sugeno fuzzy models. And all of them, they are the same thing. The only difference is what kind of a local models do we have and what kind of availability functions do we have. So if we take a look on the local model networks and instead of a Gaussian bells, we take the, uh, the virility functions that they look like this, right? So that they're composed out of the linear splines Toblerone, as I call it, right? You know, the Toblerone chocolate. Imagine that, that the validity functions would be the cross sections of two of them, something like this, right? And then on the top of it, if we had a weight, then this would be the radial basis function neural network equivalent with the different validity function. And if we had the local model placed on it, right, then it would be uh, that would be kind of a called uh, really Takagi Sugeno fuzzy model, right? So that this is explained here, right? If the local model is the uh, is the weight, then that would be a singleton model. It's called right, and it is equivalent to the radial basis function neural network. If we have the local model, that it is a linear approximation, that would be uh, equivalent to the local model network. Now, what is different about this particular 
virility functions or a membership functions, they call it in the, uh, in the fuzzy logic, right? In the fuzzy logic, you would, never, you would never hear about the virility functions, but you would find the term, the membership function, which is then again, the same thing, right? What is special about them is that they are placed on the operating space based on the prior knowledge and some sort of a linguistic rules. So that means that we know, right, if we increase the voltage in the heater, then the water in the tank, it is going to get hot, right? Or if we increase it even more, it is going to get even more hot. It is going to hot, it get hotter, right? Or if we decrease it, the temperature, right, it is going to decrease. And based on this kind of a if-then kind of a relations, then we can uh, kind of uh, set up the membership functions, right, just, just by hand, by understanding of the system. Uh, this is perfectly fine and it works well in some cases. Actually, it works well in many cases. But uh, what I do not like about I mean, this now, now I'm talking just a, a personal opinion, right? It's not that this is not mathematically. What I don't like about the fuzzy models is these membership functions are not continuous, right? Which means I cannot use for the structure optimization some sort of a derivative approach. So you can't find the derivative of it. So that means these models are never optimized. They're just set and they're never optimized. So that means you never really know, do you have an optimal model or not? Is this clear? Do you have questions regarding that? Okay, so, okay, we have another half an hour. This is fine. Uh, all right. Now, how can I start this section now? Uh, Okay, so this is now our general representation of the local model network, right? We have, for example, let's assume that we have selected the virility functions. Let's assume that we have selected the local models separately, one by one. And now we need to put them together to a one model, right? So that means joining the local models together. By doing so, we have again two options. Right. We have what we can do is we can uh, interpolate between the local models in the two ways. Right. One way is one way would be that we combine a parameters together. So of each local model. And one way would be that we combine the outputs of the each local model, like that. So imagine we have number of local models, right? Which they are weighted and this weight, right? It is, it gets changed by validity functions, right? So at each particular, at each particular instant, this weight would, would, would get changed, would be different. And this change would be governed by uh, the validity functions. So what we can do is that we have different local models. And what we do, we kind of await them by validity functions and then we sum of them together, right? Of course, this now the functions need to be normalized in order to get the, the, the appropriate output. This would be one way of doing it. The other way would be that we 
we kind of a blend or that we combine together the parameters. So each local model has its own parameterization, right? The vector of the parameters theta. And each of them, each of the parameters can be then uh, kind of a blended or change between between one set of between one parameters and the other based on the some validity functions, right? And then we would end up with uh, again with a model which would have a parameters which would be a combination of all of them, again based on the operating space. Is this clear? Do you know what I'm talking about? Come on. Are you sure that I know that I know what I'm talking that you know what I'm talking about? It is clear, but it would be interesting to see the differences in an example, but I'm sure you do. Yeah, but I mean, did you, did, okay, now repeat what I said because I don't know, did you really understand what I said? No. What I mean, the point is we have a models, right? And what we could do, we could just we, we could just stick together the outputs, right? And then we get some sort of the, the, the mixture of the, the overall output, which is the mixture of the all outputs, or we can join the parameters together, right? And though these are the two very different things, right? And now I'm going to explain what is the difference between them. I will, I will try to explain the difference. Right, so. Back to MATLAB. So first I call, close this. No, I don't want to save that. No. Now imagine that we have two local models. Imagine the CSTR system, right? At the low operating point, for example, our local model would have a response like that. At the high operating point, the local model would have a response like that, okay? So now what I can, uh, what I can do, so for example, one model would have a parameters like this. So this would be one transfer function, all right? And the other would be something like that. And now uh, let's, let's, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that with the pen and paper or with the pen and the board. Otherwise it would be, it would be too hard to, to understand. Uh, right. Just one second. Okay, do you see my, do you see the whiteboard? Not yet. No, we just see MATLAB. Yeah, okay. Like this, now you should be able to see, do you see the whiteboard now? Yes. Okay, so let's have, the the first first model would be for for example what g1 for example we will do it in continuous time domain so as a so it's easier to understand that so that would be a transfer function which would have a polynomial b1 right and uh, uh, a1 like that, right? And would be, for example, like B0 
zero. That would be one parameter B zero one. And it would be a squared plus A one one S plus A zero one, right? And uh, we defined that as a, for example, 4.5, right? S squared plus four, no, five point four S plus nine. Okay, again, right? I'm doing this live. Please, please take a look and let me know when I make a mistake. I'm sure I'm going to do it, All right? So in this case, our gain, gain would be, would be 0 0.5, right? Our damping factor is 0 0.9. And uh, natural frequency omega zero would be three radians, radians per second. Right? And the response, as we've seen here, so if the damping is quite high, right, would look something like this. So that would be our, uh, our first uh, local model. The second local model right, is the same thing. So V2 as a 2 s and then it goes b zero two s squared plus a one two s plus a zero two right and this one is then fifty one point two right s squared plus uh 3.2 s plus 64. Right? Uh, in this case, the gain, gain is 0 0.8, right? The damping factor would be 0 0.2 and the omega 0 2 would be eight radians per second. All right, and then the response, as we've seen, right, on in the MATLAB was something like this, All right? So Y, D, and this is T. So we see that the both transfer functions, they share the same structure, but only the, the parameters are very different, right? And now imagine that we have, that we have now, this is, this would be, for example, a model, uh, model one, so G1, right? And this is a model G2, right? This is the input and this is output. So now if we, if we go and we blend together or we mix together the parameters uh, with some weight. So then the overall function would look something like that. So let's call it a G uh, blending parameters P, All right? Then we would end up with something like that. So it would be B, B uh, zero one, right? So, so this is this B, right? This multiplied by weight one. No, this is omega. I want to do it by weight one plus B zero two, weight two, okay? And then S does not have any parameters, so it would be S squared plus then 
it would be like a one one weight one correct plus a one two weight two multiplied by s plus a zero one weight one plus a zero two weight two is this correct so now and then we can actually say that this becomes one parameter for example b zero p this is a p so it is like that b zero p and then it gets s squared plus then would this would be a parameter a one p for example a p s plus this parameter would be a zero p plus a zero p okay so then we would get based if you choose the weights i don't know weight weight one would be 0 0.3 and then weight two would be 0 0.7 we would get the linear combination of the parameters which will result in some in some uh kind of a model right which would have a characteristic of the of the mixture of the parameters right is this clear i guess it is that's that's relatively easy so uh what can i do now i will try to i don't know i'll do the i will do the new one so when we have when we when we put the parameters in the output form right so the, so when we blend the outputs so this would be g1s and here would be some sort of the weight one right and here would be a g2 of s in the same input right so u and here would be the weight weight two these are the multi multiplication blocks right so i will make it like this right and our, our output uh, and here is a summation block so our output would look like this so this is y so now how can we actually write then the overall uh, model so for example g let's say blending inputs of s would be g1 s multiplied by weight one plus g2 s multiplied by weight two okay uh and then g i s would then end up as b1 s and multiplied by the weight one a1 s plus b b two b two and a two s which is then again which is what which is then a one s a two s and some 
spaghetti over there, correct? So this one multiplied by this one plus this one multiplied by that one. Uh, I really don't want to do that, right? It, it'll, it'll take a lot of time. Uh, but I think what we can do is we could, I think I have it somewhere. Right, yeah, I've done that before. Uh, we can use a symbolic toolbox, right, to do that for us. Have you used symbolic toolbox before? Do you know what that is? Okay, so what we do, we defined the variables. Basically, I'm just going to run this, right? Something is wrong. Like that. So I'm going to do that, the multiplication that I did uh, on the board, like that. And uh, this will give me the polynomials B and A. I am going to make it that bigger. And I'm going to use a command pretty in order to display what I get. So what I get here is a model, right? That it is of the fourth order, right? Where before, if you remember, uh, where did I get that? Did I save it? Ah, yeah. So where before we got the polynomial and we got the model, which is of the second order. So the, the, the point is when we blend the parameters together, the structure stays the same. The structure is preserved, but when we blend the uh, outputs together, the structure becomes different. Okay. So, we get, uh, in this case, we get the fourth poly, uh, the, the characteristical polynomial, which is fourth order. And then on the top, right, the polynomial, which was pro, uh, provided zeros, right, it is of the second order, right? And uh, this, is, this is also of extreme importance to know, right? Uh, and I will, I have an example for that. Uh, which is going to show the difference between uh, blending the parameters and blending the outputs. So this is this one. Again, we have those two models, those two local models, which they, they share the same structure, right? And what we do, we, we, we interpolate between them by using some virility functions, and I'm going to run it and uh, it'll be clear. So the, low, the, the model, right, at the low operating point, and the, low, the model at the high operating point, and if we have a virility function that it blends in between them, right, it changes, it interpolates between them, so at this point, one, local model is valid and the other is, is not valid at all. For example, at this point or here at the, uh, at the middle, right, both of them are valid half-half. For example, here, the, low, the blue local model, so that means the lower local model is valid only 20% and, and uh, the high local model is valid 80%, right? And then what we get uh, here in this graph is the response that it would be created either by the blending the outputs or blending the parameters. Right? And those two surfaces below, they show us the actually the entire transition, what the responses, what the step responses would look like. So I'm going to run it, run it again. Right? So what we see that when we blend the parameters, right, we always get some sort of the second order response, which 
which is always can be found, where we can always find the gain, natural frequency, and the damping. Right? So this is, this is whatever, whatever slice you take, you would find the response which you can characterize it. Where when you blend the output is some kind of a morphing, right? It is, it is not all the time, it is not the second order response, but it actually change, changes in some way between the kind of under damp to the over damp uh, response. I'll run it again. And in this, in this graph here, we actually see the movements of the poles and zeros for both, uh, for both models. Right. So there is a significant difference how you combine the models together. Is this clear? Is this example clear? Is it clear what I wanted to explain? And do you understand? Anyone? I want questions. So now, which, 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 which realization of the local model networks is better? Which one is better? The blending parameters or blending the outputs? Parameters, why? Blending the outputs or parameters give the same poles and zeros. No, it's not the same. The, the, the poles and zeros, they move, right? Based on the, based on the weight, based on the virility functions, right? They move across, uh, around there. But the important thing is when we blend the parameters, right, the structure stays the same. So it is the same. And uh, uh, the result, with the blending parameters, if you have a local models that are second order, the resulting model, model is also second order. When we have the, the blending the outputs, if the local models are second order, the resulting model is a fourth order. So it has a higher st uh, complexity structure. Right, that's that this is important. Now, which one is better? With, with, I mean, it's, you can't really say which one is better. Uh, it, it really depends of the, uh, of the application. So no priority can be given to any of them. Now, if you want to have, if you want to have a transparency, so that means that you know exactly uh, what? Yes, then there should be four poles. Yes, with the blending of the outputs, we get a resulting model with the four poles. This is correct. And two zeros. With the blending of the, of the parameters, we get the resulting models with only with two poles. Right? Which figure plot? This one. Top right, yeah, okay. I'll run it again. So the red one, the red thing are the branding the parameters, right? Uh, okay, now. Uh, and we see that the, the red one, right, with the red ones uh, are zeros and they move from here up to here. So this is the root locus of the poles and zeros. And if I run it again, right, what you see that with the blending of the parameters, no, of the, of the outputs, the poles stay the same and the zeros, they move, right? And with the blending of the, uh, what did I do? 
Try to just do well. The poles are moving. You see the the the. Ones are zeros and ones are the poles. Okay, let's wait till it's finished and run the derivation again. So what we see in the resulting model, right, when we blend the, the um, outputs, right, so the big one, we have the fourth order characteristical polynomial where we have no weights in there. So that means the poles do not move. What it does move, only the zeros of the, of the fourth order model. With the second order model, so when the blending the parameters, there's no zeros at all, only poles are moving. Is this clear now? Yes. I mean, the stability, the stability stays the same for the outputs blending because we don't move the poles, we only move the zeros, and zeros affect the, the, the zeros affect the transient behavior. Yes, this is correct. Yeah, that's true. Uh, okay. Right. So, uh, I guess. What, where did we? Where did we finish? Uh, okay, I guess that would be enough for today, right? Uh, we will continue tomorrow with, uh, tomorrow we have only one hour and we will take a look how to use local model networks for control, right? It'll take, it'll take only one hour and then tomorrow we are then finished with, uh, uh, let's say, with the classic, uh, with the classic uh, nonlinear, nonlinear dynamic system identification. And then next week we are moving to probability models, right? We're, we're now we are we are doing something uh, slightly different. Do you have, we have another six minutes. Do you have any questions regarding what we, what I have, what I've said today? Anyone? Uh, now, today, today I was talking to Alex Shearer and he said it might be possible to have the exam face to face in June. So if this is true, and if this is possible, we will definitely have the exam face to face. I would prefer that than having it online. Now, uh, do you have any preferences? When do you want to have the exam? When in June? Would that be in the beginning of June, beginning of June, or mid of June? I don't know. Will I actually have any any influence on that? But if you do have any preferences, let me know. Okay, beginning of June as soon as possible yeah fine yeah as soon as possible uh as soon as possible is a good thing right uh but i mean again then you don't have much time to learn this is one thing but then at the same time you don't have much time to forget so maybe the beginning of june would be uh, would be would be the best but i don't know i i really don't know will that happen or not and if it does, I'll let you know, hopefully I'll know more by the, by the next week. Uh, any questions? Any further questions?
If not, that would be all for today. Have a nice evening, have a nice afternoon. I will talk to you again tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.